When you stop and look at everything that is going on in the world around us, it's easy to ask the question, is God still on the throne? You might even be thinking that God doesn't care about your situation and are struggling to find faith when God seems to be silent in your life. Let me reassure you that God is still on the throne and we are moving closer to the moment when he will return. Over the next few months, we will be taking some time to go through the book of Revelation, where God, through his servant John, shares with us pictures of what is to come and how Jesus will usher in a new heaven and a new earth where believers can participate in a life that has no more sorrow, pain, tears, or death. The book of Revelation is a confusing letter to the seven churches in Asia Minor written around 70 AD by one of the apostles named John, 60 years after Jesus died on the cross. Of course, John was one of the 12 who walked with Jesus and became an eyewitness to the resurrection. John was banished to the island of Patmos because of his claims about Jesus. And it was on the island that John saw the visions that he wrote to the churches in Asia. Some of those cities still exist today. The book of Revelation is a letter that John writes and it's broken into parts. The beginning is his greeting and his admonition to the seven churches. And then in chapter four, he starts recounting the visions God has given him about what is to come. John writes about these visions in a style of writing called apocalypse, which uses symbols and imagery to convey meaning. Apocalypse is a Greek word meaning disclosure or dis sorry, discourse or revelation. It often views the world through two lenses, God and his angels, or the devil and demons. This type of literature assumes this cosmic conflict and divine intervention. It's a narrative in the first person recording a series of revelations or visions or journeys to heaven with a guide revealing secrets or mysteries unavailable to humans. Our interpretation of the letter must mean the same to all generations of readers, first century up until today. And the principle that we follow as we look at this letter that John writes is that God's word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The main content is not so much the heavenly world or the future, but visions speaking to the world of the Roman Empire and Christians living at that time as well as us today and throughout history. And there are many different motifs that are used in Revelation that are also found in other writings like the coming kingdom and the pain of woes and judgment that we see in the book of Revelation. Revelation is actually like a political cartoon. It's the prism through which the world is viewed. And all of these things make this letter that John writes a little confusing. And over the next few months, we're going to unpack this and glean some great truths about what is yet to come. The letter is written like a story, a narrative of a great cosmic story of God with scenes or acts in a play that speak to the reality of what God is up to from a big picture perspective. So today we're going to jump right in at John's first vision and that starts in Revelation chapter 4. And he sets the stage by telling us in verse 1, After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. Here's the context of all of the visions that are laid out in the whole letter that he writes. Come up here and I will show you what may, must take place after this. As he continues telling what happened, he says, At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnarian. 
And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. And around the throne were 24, elder, 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire where the seven spirits of God are. And before the throne, there was as it were a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature is like a lion. The second living creature is like an ox. And the third living creature with the face of a man. And the fourth living creature like the eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the phone, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. The picture we see is a throne room with God sitting on the throne, four living creatures, none like we have seen before, but in the appearance of a lion, ox, man, and an eagle. And then there's these 24 elders on 24 thrones and lightning and thunder coming out of the throne and many objects before and around the throne. And when we read this, and even just listening to this for the first time, maybe, we get confused if we try to understand the picture of what is being described. Everything in the picture looks and sounds weird to us. It raises many questions like, why are there only 24 elders on thrones? And why are there many thrones and not just one throne? Are there seven spirits of God? And what are the living creatures? You see, the letter that John wrote to the churches was written during a time period of intense persecution for Christians. It was written in a way that only believers could understand by using visions, and within those visions, all kinds of imagery. The pagan people in the world at that time would not have the reference point for many of the things in the visions that God showed John so that it actually wouldn't even make sense to them. When God gives people visions, they are not meant to explain the little details, but speak to overall ideas or concepts that God is trying to communicate to humanity about himself. And all through the book of Revelation, there is dialogue that is heard and written down for us. It's actually in the dialogue that we see what the picture is meant to communicate. As we try and interpret Revelation, it's helpful to be able to separate the dialogue from the picture. It's the dialogue that tells us what is happening. And remember the context is what things will take place. So the dialogue reveals three characteristics about God, which is what the picture or vision that John sees is trying to communicate to us. And we're just going to go through these three characteristics about what we see in Revelation chapter 4 that set the stage of this cosmic battle that is playing out in real time in a realm that you and I can't see called heaven. The first one that we see this characteristic about God is that God's authority is eternal. Notice the dialogue in verse 8. It says, day and night, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. The living creatures are the ones that are saying this. This first phrase of dialogue says how holy God is and that he is Lord God Almighty, meaning he is pure 
and master over all. Nothing is above him. He alone has the final say of everything. In the vision that John sees, the imagery of thrones and jewels are meant to tell us of God's majesty, his holiness, his purity. The imagery of the throne speaks to his rulership. The elders and the living creatures speaks to his authority over all things. The fact of God's eternalness is pictured in how the living creatures are always speaking. You see, what the imagery is meant to communicate is that God's authority is eternal. As the living creatures said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And in fact, as we say this, we are joining in to those living creatures that are saying those things right now in our time. This is to bring great comfort to us, knowing that whatever happens in our world, God is still on the throne. He will and has always existed. In all of his existence, he has always been Lord Almighty. He has always been holy and he will always be holy. This also speaks to the reverence we should have towards God. Respect him for who he is. Trust that he is in control of whatever seems like an out-of-the-control world, where he is interested in the details of our life. This is the God who is Lord over all. And as we think about this overall picture that is playing out in John's mind, nothing can defeat this God who is the Lord Almighty. You see, the stage is being set for this cosmic play being played out where we get this first scene of God in his authority over all things. Here's another characteristic that we see in John's vision about God, and that is God is worthy of worship. Notice as the dialogue continues in verse 11, it says, and these are the four living creatures that are saying this, they say, worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. When we look at the vision that John describes, we see elders and living creatures worshiping God who is on the throne, casting their crowns before the king. God alone is worthy of worship. He is Lord and God. He is to receive all the glory, honor, and power, which means his creatures, that is angels, humans, and any other created being are to give him the same worship, the same distinction of worth as the living creatures and the elders who are in the vision, who in real time right now in heaven are saying the same thing because they never cease to say these things. If we see God in the same light as worthy, then we will give him his due, not because God demands it, but because he is worthy of it. There are all kinds of things which we ascribe worth to in this world. We pay money for things that are more worth to us than other things. We pay more for expertise. We give more worth to worthy causes because we value the cause over other causes. That's really what worth is. It's the level at which someone deserves to be valued at. So what worth does God deserve? Well, there's nothing more valuable than God. There is no one more deserving of worship than Almighty God. Even though we don't see everyone bowing down to God's truth, he is still worthy of respect and reverence. So how do you display God's worth? Each and every person, it doesn't matter who you are or where you are, displays God's worth by everything we do. How we treat others, how we treat God himself, what we do with our time, even how we approach each and every day. We need to remind ourselves of this often. God's worth is totally wrapped up in who God is. And our worth is totally wrapped up in God because we're created in his image. 
God is worthy of worship. So let us give him what he is due, not because he demands it, but because he is worthy of it. And this is one of the big picture cosmos stories of who God is. And this is a characteristic that he is worthy of our worship. And not just us, but all of the universe. Everything within the universe, whether it's known or unknown, is to worship this God who created all things. Here's another characteristic of God we see in the dialogue of John's vision. And this is God's will is why things exist. As we continue reading in verse 11, it says, For you, and again, these are the four living creatures are saying this, For you created all things, and by your will they existed. The living creatures are making a statement regarding everything in this world. Everything John is about to see, everything that is happening in real time to John and the early church. God is the only one who created the world we see and touch. God's will is the reason everything exists. Now, that doesn't mean that everything that happens in our world, God wants to happen. There are many things that happen in our world that grieve the heart of a loving God. But because of sin and free choice, pain and suffering find their way into the lives of you and myself. God's will is still over all those unfortunate situations, and he will bring justice to bear in each situation. That's his promise to humanity. May we not lose sight of God's will in the midst of a turbulent world. You see, God does have a plan for everything, and the visions he is about to give John share with us how the end of time will play out, how God will bring justice to bear on all those injustices, how he will bring hope and peace and joy to these people who love him and follow him. You see, God's plan for salvation, helping people and caring for their soul is central to everything God does. This is the big picture cosmic story of who God is. May each of us trust God's will as we look to the last days knowing that his care is for his people. How he will save his people in their darkest hour. How he plans to defeat sin, Satan, demons, the systems of the world. And how things will play out before his return. The visions of Revelation tell us that Jesus is coming back. And we need to be prepared for that moment when the heavens will open and Christ returns to make all things right. The book of Revelation is God telling John what is about to take place. And over the next few months, we're just going to be unpacking all of these visions and digging into what God is preparing for you for me, as we put our faith in Jesus. You see, we get prepared for Jesus' return as we place our faith in Jesus and trust him in a broken world that does not follow God's commands. We need to be ready for the things to play out that are written of in the book of Revelation. And hopefully, over the next few months as we go through this, your understanding will increase. You will see the things that God has foretold playing out in the world around us. And you will know that God is real and that God loves you and he cares about you and he wants to deliver you from the pain and suffering of this world. Let's take some time and pray. Dear God, we thank you for the visions that you gave John. Lord, I pray today as we have begun unpacking these visions that you would just help us understand the truth of revelation, the visions that John saw that you gave to him to communicate what is to come. And God, we find ourselves living in these days where we are seeing the things that are written in revelation play out in our world around us. So Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts, that you would open our minds to see, that you would reveal yourself to us, that each of us, as we listen to these words, would place our faith in you, and we would put our hope in you. God, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, that you 
have a plan and that you created all things and by your will they exist and were created for you. God, we worship you because you alone are worthy and we know that you are God Almighty sitting on the throne right now. So God, we thank you for your son Jesus. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. And we pray, Lord, that you would come and come quickly. And we ask all of this in the name of your son Jesus. Amen.